Good. OK, so let me draw the circuit diagram for LC's, um, RC circuit that we were looking at before. So when we have an RC circuit, could somebody remind me if, um, uh, oh, I was doing the square wave thing, right? With the RC circuit? OK. <coughs> um, let me give you the simpler version. So in a simpler version, I can give you two types of RC circuit. So uh, first type is the, this is the one that's, uh, I guess, uh, mathematically more, com uh, uh, mathematically simpler. So I could build an RC circuit this way, where I have a capacitor and a register and nothing else. Right? I mean, you can build the circuit, right? Um, but but uh, you wouldn't get anything interesting out of this circuit because you know it, there's no battery there, <laughs> nothing. Um, so to get something interesting out of this, what you have to imagine is that you charge up this capacitor initially, so that you say, you have to imagine that at time equals zero, you had some charge plus Q naught and minus Q naught on this um, on this capacitor and that at some time you connected the circuit and then let current to starting to wait let current to starting to flow I guess this way through the circuit that's what you have to imagine and uh, let, let me actually combine this with a second type of circuit so second type of circuit is a circuit that you needed to make this happen in the first place so let me do that in slightly different color um, so the second circuit would be if I have, let's say, I have a battery hooked up here. Mm, I want to hook it up so that this end is negative, this end is positive. And what I am going to have here is a switch network. So let me call this point A. Um, call this point B. And I have a switch between them. Yeah. So when this switch is close to A, that's when this uh, battery will charge up this capacitor. When this uh, switch is hooked up here, I have a current flowing this way. And the current will charge up this side of the capacitor with a positive charge and uh, will eventually result in this shape. Um, Yes, and once it's charged up, then we could, uh, you know, switch it around and say, at time equals zero. At time equals zero, we are going to close this switch over to the B side, and then, um, and then, you know, battery. We can ignore it. There's no current through this entire branch. We can just ignore that it's there, and then we have um, we have that simpler circuit that I initially started out drawing. So let me do case one first, because this one is mathematically simpler. And then uh, we'll look at case two um, as uh, how, um, uh, so the realistic version. So the, the thing that you're looking at in the lab, it's uh, um, you kind of have to imagine where you, uh, you flip this switch at a regular interval. That's what your square wave essentially is. Your square wave, when it's on, uh, will be this portion and then you know wait half a second and then switch it to the other side Wait half a second. There'll be the one Hertz square wave um, That's uh, um, sort of switching between on and off except in your lab It was plus voltage and then minus voltage. I'm gonna change it in the next semester so that um, Yeah, yeah good Okay, so let's do let's uh, wrap up uh, part one. I'm going to write down the equations um, quickly because we have done most of that on Monday, so Let's say, so for one, we are using Kirchhoff's rules. So the only rule I need to use is the junction rule. So junction rule that says, sorry, not junction rule, loop rule. Loop rule, so I'm considering this loop. Let's say, um, I want to draw my loop in the direction that the current is going. So when this switch is close to B, uh, will my current flow clockwise or counterclockwise? Counterclockwise? Yeah, this is the positive end. So the voltage here is higher than the voltage here. So current will flow to the left to, across the register. And that's consistent with counterclockwise direction of uh, current. 
Okay. So this will be both my direction of current and the loop that I'm picking. So going around this loop, uh, let me start it from here. <laughs> Starting from this position here, when I go through the loop, the sum of all the changes of voltage going through the loop is equal to, um, so going from one side, the lower voltage side of the capacitor to the higher voltage side of the capacitor will give me a gain in voltage. Anybody here remember the how, much, how much amount of voltage? If not, um, this is the relationship I go back to. I'm dealing with the capacitor. This is the definition of capacitance. Anytime you're dealing with a capacitor, if you're not using this, you're probably doing something wrong. So, yes. Yeah, V is here, yeah, Q over C, yeah. Do that quick algebra, so. All right, so the voltage here is the amount of charge on the capacitor. Um, Q, I'm going to write this to remind myself that Q, it's a Q as a function of time over C, and plus, because I chose my direction so that I'll get a voltage rise. And then keep going in the loop. As I go across this register, I'm going to lose the voltage of minus I R. I'm writing this as a reminder to myself that current is a function of time. That's equal to zero. So this is simpler than what we were dealing with the last time because it doesn't have a, an independent voltage source. So, so it's simpler. Um, so let's just uh, try solving this simple equation. So, um, hmm. so this doesn't really calculus um, Let's see. So this is what we did last time. So we look at how many unknowns we have. We see that we have two unknowns, charge and current. And if you just leave it there, we don't have enough information to solve it. So we need to bring in one, at least one more piece of information. What was that? Yeah, the expression for current through capacitor, that it's the derivative of the amount of charge on the capacitor. Because, um, and let me make sure everything is right. Yeah, this is where I have to be careful with the sign. Um, if I have a positive current flowing, then the charge on the capacitor is decreasing, right? Yes? So as I have it written it here, it's not quite right. Because as I have positive current flowing, my dQdt is um, negative. So I'm just going to do this, um, minus dQdt. Good. It's a matter of you know, which direction of current did I say was positive. Or, you know, uh, so it, you know, this Q, once you have defined it, it can actually be positive or negative. It's a matter of which side you call positive side. And, um, um, and you know, if it's charged actually the other way, then the amount of Q will be negative. So, so, the, I, so I always go through this exercise. I always think through, as imagine the Q is changing um, from one particular way to some other direction that I think is natural. Uh, how does that direction of current match with the direction that I said was positive? And I insert whatever sign necessary here so that my definition of, uh, my sign conventions are consistent with each other. Comment, question? Yeah, okay. Yeah, so, um, so anyway, so, you know, if you didn't go through it, you'll see some sign error somewhere as you're working through the problem. Good. Okay, so I need to use this information to write down a single differential equation. So this becomes, so um, it becomes a function of a chart or equation involving Q alone. I get Q as a function of time over C minus this, uh, so minus minus plus. R times dQ dt is equal to zero. Right. So, uh, so this is differential equation, and unlike my physics 4A class, most of you has seen most of you have seen differential equation in your math classes. Right. So, so actually, um, a lot of what we are doing this week and next week actually will be dealing with the differential equations. So. Um, so just be ready for that. Um, so when I see differential equation, I do the same thing that I do when I see a polynomial equation. Like when you see polynomial equation, the standard form to put in 
is where the highest order term is your leading term, right? And then you write down the rest. You do the same thing with the differential equation. You look at the order of derivatives. This says zeroth order derivative, as in no derivative. This says first order derivative. So I'm going to solve everything here in terms of this first order derivative term. So let me write that down that way. dq dt, first order derivative, is equal to, I move this over to the other side, minus q over c, and then I have to multiply through by 1 over r. So minus 1 over rc q of t. So this is my differential equation in some kind of a standard form that's easier to tackle. So, um, so the step I'm going through now is what you are going through or were supposed to be going through in lab. Um, separation of variables and actually solving this differential equation. And I will tell you um, in this week and next week, you are going to see me um, approach differential equations in two different ways. So um, today, I'll be solving it mostly like a mathematician would, you know, through proper steps, using separation of variable and all that. Um, the moment I start seeing second order differential equations, I'm going to stop doing that. I'm just going to guess a solution, and they will conveniently be right. <laughs> Only because I know what the correct answer is before I guess it. Um, but so, you know, this one, I can pr do the proper steps, so let me do that. Um, I don't do that too often. So I'm, I use this um, approach called the separation of variables. Um, you are supposed to have seen this, I think, in your Math 3B class. You are supposed to have seen this already. If not, you know, re or if you don't remember, please see if you, uh, review it. So the way I separate the variables is um, I look at the, the dynamical, the, my variables here. Let me underline them in green and red. I have two variables here. I have, um, or let me box them. I have Q as a variable. Here's my Q. And I have T as a variable. And let me actually erase this for now, but because I think this statement that Q is a function of time, I think that's more confusing than clarifying. So when you look at it here, I have some quantities that are constant. These I don't worry about too much. I'll just let them lie wherever they are. Um, what I'm concerned with here is these variables. And the, the solution technique here is I put all the terms um, involved uh, all the one type of variable on one side and the other type of variable on the other side. That's why we call it separation of variable. So I want, put, I want to put all the Q terms on one side and all the T terms on the other side. And so, all right, I guess the easiest way to do here is move the Q over here and move DT over to the other side by imagining multiplying through by. So this is what you are imagining me doing, take this and multiply through by dt over q, which is a bit of an uh, abuse of notation because this dt is not just an algebraic symbol, but I'm not going to be worried about that for now. Uh, I got other things to worry about. So let me write that out. Uh, when I do that, I get dq over q is equal to minus 1 over rc dt. And this is now an equation that you can solve by integration. Because left-hand side, you look at it for a while and you see, oh, this is something I can integrate. Um, this says uh, my integral is going to be in terms of q, and I have an expression in terms of only q. Like, I do remember q is a function of time, but here it's not written as an explicit function of time, so I don't have to worry about that. It depends on time. And this side, I have only constant, so if I integrate it, I'll just get t. So, so really, this, uh, this step is the separation of variables, and the rest is just the simple integral. You are, no, I guess it's not quite um, fundamental theorem of calculus. But you, know, you are doing a simple integral. Um, once again, I'm not going to be too concerned with the niceties of uh, notation. Other than one thing. So when I do integral, I will tell you this. In physics, I have found it very useful to get into habit of always doing definite integrals. Like, uh, I never do an indefinite integral in physics 
Because in physics, there's really no reason ever to do an indefinite integral. Anything that you can do as an indefinite integral, you can do it as a definite integral. So when you do it as definite integral, this is uh, what I say. So here's my integration variable. I want to make a statement that this variable takes on some value. It goes from some initial value to a final value. right? And as this variable is changing that way, what was the initial value of time? The way I'm trying to set it up. Zero, zero right? All right. All right. So initial value of zero. So as time changes from zero to some final value, um, so this is the statement I'm making when I set the limits here. I say, all right, my charge Q is going to go, some from, go from some initial value that I will write down soon to a final value which I'm trying to find. So when you put, on, put in this limit, you are making the statement. You are saying, as this uh, one variable changes from one to the other, this other variable changes from one to the other. Yeah? Yeah. Uh, I, I found this to be useful because it gets, uh, it first it makes your integrals more concrete. You have to actually think about what's physically happening rather than just uh, regurgitating memorized um, integral formulas. And also, this ensures that you never forget your integration constant. Because when you do, in, I mean, how many times have you lost points in your calculus class because you forgot integration constant? Right? Not, not, I mean, there should be more hands. Yeah, but like when you do definite integrals, you never have to worry about it. It's automatically taken care of. So, all right, initial, so final value is something I'm trying to find. What is my initial value of charge? My initial value of charge. Q naught. Yeah. That's where you kind of have to read the problem and figure out, OK, what was my initial condition? Sometimes the problem doesn't give you one. Here, I actually gave you one, that I your initial charge was Q naught. So all right, so Q is equal to Q naught. All right, that's it. So this is, it's, as far as calculus problems go, this is actually a pretty simple calculus problem. It's the setting up part that's a, um, that's a, uh, more complicated. So, all right, let's uh, do this integral and get an answer. So, uh, we're, I, let me start it here. So, uh, left hand side, uh, it's 1 over x. So, I need to bring in logarithm. Antiderivative of 1 over x is logarithm of x. So, left hand side is natural log of q evaluated from limit of Q naught to Q final. Right hand side is simpler. It's equal to minus dt, that just t. So minus t over rc evaluated from limit of t equals 0 to t final. 0 to t final. Um, can I skip some of the logarithm algebra steps on the left hand side? Because it's going to be logarithm of qf minus logarithm of q naught. That means if I combine the arguments, what do arguments look like when he? So I'm going to uh, not write down a logarith uh, logarithm algebra step. Tell me what the answer is if I do ln qf minus ln q naught. How do you simplify that? The differences become ratios. OK, so that's going to be the left hand side, ln qf over q naught. That's equal to, uh, right hand side is easy, so I'll do that one. Minus tf over rc. Oops, well, I don't know why I turned to see it. All right, uh, I want to solve for qf, my final charge. And actually, um, so I use that subscript f so that I don't confuse myself, you know. Uh, this Q with the other Q, but um, at this point, what I would actually prefer to do is say that the final charge is a function of time. It's a function of a variable. And turn this TF as a variable T. Yeah, yeah met a mathematician would be more, too more careful with this. Like, they would probably put primes and do things like that, but it seems like too much hassle for me. All right, so I'm trying to solve for this Q. So I guess what I should do is uh, raise this. Uh, so this will become power of E. So that when I do that, so you know, when I raise this whole thing to power of 
So, or you know, make it an argument to exponential, that exponential and logarithm will cancel each other out. And on the left hand side, I will end up with, uh, on the left hand side, I'll end up with Q, uh, let me do it, keep doing it in black. Um, Q as a function of time over Q naught. And on the right hand side, it will be this ra uh, raised to power of E. So e to the minus t over rc. Okay. And all right, um, let's go one more step. So actually solve for this, then you end up with q as a function of time is equal to q naught times e to the minus t over rc. Okay. So this is the simplest case. And I can kind of demonstrate it to you um, in a real circuit. So I took some time setting this up. Let's hope it works this time. 